Salam alaikum alaikum salam on la buena noche. I hope you guys are having a great night and I pray that you have a good set, a good Thanksgiving day and a happy Thanksgiving for those who celebrate the Thanksgiving of holiday. Um, I'm gonna jump off a little bit off the Bantu Congo reading and I'm just gonna read something from the Hermetic philosophy uh, and it's based on the cause and effect, the way they see it and understood it. Um, just a little something to change a little bit of the flavor. Um, I'm not going to read much. The book is a little bit confusing to me. Uh, the way it's written, the fonts that it uses is not using just plain, simple fonts, more uh, uh, classy, uh, <laughs> as you would say. OK, let's start. The great six hermetic principle, the principle of cause and effect embodies the truth that law pervades the universe, that nothing happens by chance. That chance is merely a term indicating cause existing but not recognized or perceived. That phenomena is continuous without break or exception. The, the principle of cause and effect underlies all scientific thoughts, ancient and modern, and was enunciated by the Hermetic teachers in the earliest days. While many and varied disputes between the many schools of thought have since arisen, these disputes have been principally upon the detail of the operation of the principle and still more often upon the meaning of certain words. The underlying principle of cause and effect has been accepted as correct by practically all thinkers of the world worthy of the name. To think otherwise would be to take the phenomena of the universe from the domain of law and order and to regulate it to the control of the imaginary something which men have called chance. A little consideration will show anyone that there is, in reality, not such thing as per chance. Wester defines the word chance as follows, a supposed agent or mode of activity other than a force, law, or purpose, the operation or activity of such agent. The supposed effect of such an agent, a happening, fortuity, casualty, etc. But a little consideration will show you that there can be no such agent as chance in the sense of something outside of the law, something outside of cause and effect. How could there be something acting in the phenomenal universe independently of the law, order, and continuity of the matter or of the latter. Such a something will be entirely independent of the orderly trend of the universe and therefore superior to it. We can imagine nothing outside of the all being outside of the law and that only because the all law is the law in, in itself. There is no room in the universe for a something outside of and independent of the law. The existence of such something will render all natural law ineffective and will plunge the universe into chaotic disorder and lawlessness. A careful examination will show you that what we call chance is merely an expression relating to obscure causes, causes that we cannot perceive, causes that we cannot understand. The word chance is derived from a word meaning to fall as the falling of dice. The idea being that the fall of dice and many other happenings are merely a happening unrelated to any cause. And this is the sense in which the term is generally employed. But when the matter is closely examined, it is seen that there is no chance whatsoever about the fall of the dice. Each time a die falls, and displays a certain number, it obeys a law as infallible as that which governs the revolution of the planet around the sun. Back of the fall of the die are causes or chains of causes running back further than mind can follow. Well, uh, other words, running back further than the mind can follow. The position of the die in the box, meaning the the actual dice, they're calling it the die is like the dot and the box of the square of the dice. The amount of the muscular energy expended in the throw, the condition of the, ta of the tablet, etc., all are causes. 
the effect of which may be seen. But back of these seen of these seen causes there are chains of unseen preceding causes, all of which had a bearing upon the number of the die which fell uppermost. If a die be cast a great number of times, it will be found that the numbers shown will be about equal, that is, there will be an equal number of one spot, two spot, etc., etc., coming uppermost. Toss a penny in the air, and it may come down either heads or tails, but, but make a sufficient number of tosses, and the heads and tails will about, will about even up. We mean that if you throw a penny, the majority of the time, you count how many fall on, on tails and how many fall on heads, all those tosses that you made will about come as even. That's what it's speaking about. But both the average and the single toss come under the law of cause and effect. And if we were able to examine into the preceding causes, it would be clearly seen that it was simply impossible for the die to fall other than it did under the same circumstances and at the same time. Even the same causes, the same results will follow. There is always a cause and because to every everything. Nothing ever happens without a cause or rather a chain of causes. Some confusion has arisen in the minds of persons considering this principle from the fact that they were unable to explain how one thing could cause another thing, that is, be the creator of the second thing as a matter of fact. No thing ever causes or creates another thing. Causes and effect deals merely with events. An event is that which comes, arrives, or happens as a result or consequence of some preceding event. No event creates another event, but is merely a preceding link in the great ordering chain of events from following from the creative energy of the all. There is continuity between all events precede, precedent, consequent, and subconsequent. There is a relation existing between everything that has gone before and everything that follows. A stone is dislodged from a mountain side and crashes through a roof of a cottage in a valley below. At first sight, we regard this as a chance of effect, but when we examine the matter, we find a great chain of cause behind it. In the first place, there was the rain which softened the earth, supporting the stone, and which allowed it to fall. Then back of that was the influence of the sun, other rains, etc., which gradually disintegrated the piece of rock from a large piece. Then they, were, then they were the causes which led to the formation of the mountain and it upheaval, upheaval by convulsion of nature and so on ad infinitum. Then we might follow up the causes behind the rain, etc. Then we might consider the existence of the roof. In short, we would soon find ourselves involved in a mesh of cause and effect from which we would soon strive to extricate ourselves. Just as a man has two parents, four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents, and sixteen great-great-grandparents, and so on until when, say, forty generations are calculated, the number of ancestors run into many millions. So it is with the number of causes behind even the most trifling event or phenomena. Such are the passage of a tiny speck of sot before your eye. It is not an easy matter to trace the bit of sot back to the early period of the world's history when it formed a part of a massive tree trunk, which was afterward converted into coal and so on until as the speck of sot it now pass before your vision on its way to another adventure and a mighty chain of events causes an effect brought into its present condition and later is but one of the chain of events will, which will go to produce other events hundreds of years from now one of the series of events arises from the tiny bit of salt was writing of these lines which caused the types typesetter to perform certain words a proofreader to do likewise and which will arouse certain thoughts in your mind and that of others which in turn would affect others and so on and on and on 
beyond the ability of man to think further and all from the passage of a tiny bit of sot, all of which shows the relativity and association of things and further fact that there is no great, there is no small in the mind that causes all. Read a little bit more. Stop to think a moment if, if a certain man had not met a certain maid away back in the dim period of the Stone Age. You who are now reading these lines will not know, would not now be here. And if perhaps the same couple have failed to meet, we who now write these lines will not know, would not now be here. And the very act of writing on our part and the act of reading on yours will affect not only the prospective lives of yourselves and ourselves, but will also have a direct or indirect effect upon many other people now living and who will live in the ages to come. Every thought we think, every act we perform has its direct and indirect result which fit into the great chain of cause and effect. We do not wish to enter into a consideration of free will or determination in this work for various reasons. Among the many reasons is the principle one that neither side or the controversy is entirely right. In fact, both sides are partially right according to the Hermetic teaching. The principle of polarity shows that both are but half truths. The opposing poles of truth, the teachings are that a man be both free and yet bound by necessity, depending upon the meaning of the term and the height of the truth from which the matter is examined. The ancient writers expressed the matters thus. The further the creation is from the center, the more it is bound. The nearer the center is, the center is reaches the nearer free it is the majority of people are more or less the slaves of of her heredity 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 environment etc and manifest very little freedom they are swayed by the opinions customs and thoughts of the outside world and also by their emotion feelings and moods the manifest the manifest sorry they manifest no mastery worthy of the name they indignantly rep re re repudiate these assertions, saying, Why? I certainly am free to act and do as I please. I do just what I want to do. But they fail to explain whence rise the want to and as I please. What makes them want to do one thing and, pre and, and in preference to and another? What makes them please to do this and not to do that? Is there no because there is pleasing and wanting? The master can change these pleases and wants into others at the opposite end of the mental pole. He is able to will, to will instead of to will because some feeling, mood, or emotion, or environment suggestion arouses a tendency or desire within him so to do. And so, I don't want to read too much and get you guys confused. Uh, this is a book called uh, the Kabbalion or the Kabillion. It's a, a hermetic philosophy. Uh, it's you can find it, I guess, in the internet cheap. Uh, this is one of the books I had put away um, in a box for a while, and I've been dinging up some, you know, one of my one or two of my boxes, and I've been finding a couple of stuff that I read back in the days or, or years ago, and. Just bring it back up just to give you a little piece. You can find it. It's called the Kabbalion or the Kabillion. K-Y-B-A-L-I-O-N is hermetic philosophy. Um, and it's not to practice, you know, these practices because as we here in Palo, we we are in Ganguleros. We practice in Kisimalongo. But there are things in some of these books that are uh, easy to understand because there are some perspectives here that we do follow also you know and um, cause and effect is one of them i hope you understood my reading i made a couple of mistakes but the writing is a little i don't know um how to put my face real <laughs> real close down to it to see the letters the letters are big they're not that small but i was having difficulty with the with the wording the way they word the stuff you know 
But anyway, guys, have a great night. Happy Thanksgiving. And salam alaikum, alaikum, salak, and sambi lo and talk to you soon.